Yang berbahagia, Profesor Dr. Ismi Arif Ismail, yang berusaha Profesor Dr. Aslinda Abdullah, semua Profesor-Profesor yang hadir, um, kepada para pelajar dan kawan-kawan media yang hadir, saya ucapkan terima kasih kerana jemput saya untuk, untuk datang uh, berkongsi pengalaman dengan anda semua. Uh, saya telah diberi topik dalam bahasa English dan saya juga tahu ada pelajar antarabangsa yang hadir jadi izinkan saya untuk gunakan bahasa English. Um, good morning everybody, I'm so pleased and honoured to be here. Once in a while, I do accept invitation to come and speak to students, especially in universities, just to help me feel a little bit more intelligent, um, being in your presence uh, and mingling with professors. So today I've been given the topic, um, challenges of balanced youth development in the cyber era. I just want to share with you my experience working as a lawmaker understanding the problems out there and how do you find solutions and intervention. The challenges are so huge, so many challenges, but where do you start? So for me to do that, uh, allow me to share with you just very slight uh, uh, history or background of how I got involved in lawmaking. Uh, like many, many young people, um, I, I was raised in Subang Jaya, born in Kuala Lumpur, raised in Subang Jaya, and I went to Sekolah Kebangsaan Subang Utama. So I, I was uh, trained as a leader in school, uh, very involved in core curriculum activities, because at that time we were told uh, about Wawasan 2020, uh, that's the vision for the country. Uh, we were told that you have to study hard, collect certificates. Uh, so we got ourselves very busy with joining this club and that club, just so that, you know, after SPM, you have a pile of certificates because apparently the pile of certificates would help you get into better universities. And so I went on this mission to collect certificates um, at the expense of my studies. So I was the head prefect for my school. Uh, and as a head prefect, you would be expected to do science. But my interest was never science. And so peer pressure was a big problem for me. Uh, being the leader, so I signed up for science and obviously I did very, very poorly. I only managed grade one. I still have, until today, nightmare about sitting for SPM, our from five exam. Um, and so uh, after that episode of not doing well in my studies and being used as a bad example in school, uh, I mean, I was used as an example to all the prefects. You need to find balance, don't be too active on core curriculum activities at the expense of your studies because you would end up like her. And back then, I'm talking about maybe 30 years ago in Subang Jaya, it's not that big like today. And so you would go into Kafu uh, or Subang Parade and you would bump into a lot of people. And so when I, when I went out, I, you know, I felt like it was very hard at that time, I was 18 years old, to lift my head up and walk. And as a result, I didn't go out. So I went through a very brief period of depression. So I understand when we talk about youth well-being, uh, very, very low self-esteem. Uh, and it was also at that time that I went on an exchange program. I share with you this because these are all very real challenges for me and how that impacted my well-being. So I went on an exchange program to New Zealand for one month. And I lived in a caravan. I lived with farmers and also during that time, um, I, I don't eat, until today, I don't eat red meat. So when you go to a cold country and you don't eat red meat, what do you eat? You eat potatoes with sour cream. And then at night, you feast on Cadbury chocolates. I'm not talking about the Kit Kat small one, you know. I'm talking about one bar. The, you know, one bar because it's so cheap. And you must remember my background. I didn't do well in science, so I didn't know there's calories in food. And so every night I would eat one bar because I was constantly thinking, I don't have rice, I don't have rice. Other people are eating red meat, so this is what I would feast on. And so after a few weeks, when I returned, back then no KLIA airport, it was Subang airport. When I arrived in Subang airport, my family members could not find me <laughs> because they could not recognize me. In a few weeks, I put in 10 kilograms. Okay? Now, after that, it was also the season of clubbing. I know after SPM, friends would go out partying. But here I am, I couldn't dress up 
the way others could because I was 10 kilos heavy for an 18 year old. I was constantly asked at that age, are you pregnant? Are you pregnant? And so really impacted my well-being even, even more. And so when I finally started uni uh, in Taylor's, and then after that I did a twinning program uh, with KDU, I, I told myself that I would not do... So I went the other extreme. No more core curriculum activities. Just focus on getting my degree. Just study, go to college, uni, study, go home, pass your exam, that's all. And so I did the other extreme. And, and so finally, I landed in Australia, Tasmania, did my law degree, two years. And then I came back to do my bar. Uh, and then I went back to do my CLP because like many, many young Malaysians, I wanted to migrate. I, I felt like, oh, you know, in the Asian society, people would always judge you for your weight. Chinese New Year, everybody will always be talking about weight. Here, right? Like overseas, men don't comment about women's weight that much. But here, well, they always talk about your weight. And so that kind of, I said, okay, I want to go and live in a farm. I want to go live overseas, you know, where I can just mind my own business. Nobody would care what I eat, what I dress, how I look like. Over here, relatives, everybody would be always making comment. And so that was my aim. Let's just get a job and migrate, like many, many young Malaysians who have migrated. But my PR application was not approved. I applied for PR in Australia, not approved, even though I got a job as a lawyer uh, in the city of Hobart. And so after a brief uh, sting as a lawyer, I came back um, very, very reluctantly. I came back and I started working as a lawyer for three years. After working as a lawyer for three years, I went on to work as an event uh, manager because I didn't really like uh, being in a professional uh, job even weekends you work with very little salary. I'm talking about back then, uh, this is year, year 2003, 1,800 ringgit. And mind you, I came from Subang Jaya, middle class, 1,008. And at the end of every month, I didn't have savings. Despite living with my parents, food was free at home, accommodation was free, Wi-Fi free, Astro free, everything free. I couldn't really survive. And so when I went into event management, I just wanted... You know, I, I accepted the part about salary, but I really wanted a more balanced working lifestyle. So no, don't have to work Saturday and Sunday, you know, free and easy. I can just go. Uh, at, at that time, I was handling what kind of events. I was doing a lot of contest management in shopping malls. So, you know, if you spend 100 ringgit in Mid Valley, come and redeem a free gift at my redemption booth. My job at the time was to replenish all the redemption items for the redemption booth in all the shopping malls in Klang Valley. So I really, I was very happy. I, was, I, I found that so enjoyable. I didn't have to worry about contractual terms, checking legal documents. Here I am just checking receipts, you know, 100 ringgit, that's very easy. So I was very happy doing that. From a professional, I did event management and I was very, very happy. Okay, now when I was doing event management, I have a lot more time to have lunch with my friends, school friends. So I caught up with my friends from school. His name is Edward Ling. And Edward started telling me, he said, hey, you know, uh, as young Malaysians, I think we should stop complaining about the state of our country and go out and vote. You know that you can vote. So I said, I, I, I'm not interested, but you know, I want to support you because he's, he was, he's very interested in politics. So I signed up as a voter to vote for the first time at the age of 29 years old. I joined the DAP, Tony Poa came back, uh, I was introduced to Tony Poa. And this one thing, I think a lot of people think uh, if you are a certain, or you are of this race, then you have to join this political party. So people are talking about a, a lot of race-based parties. So Chinese, then you have to join MCA. But remember, I went to Sekolah Kebangsaan, I didn't know Chinese, I didn't know Mandarin. I only can converse in Bahasa and, and English and Cantonese. So I don't know Mandarin. Now, if I join MCA, I will be very lost because they, they all communicated in Mandarin, even in a lot of the materials and all that. So when Tony Poa came back, the former MP of Petaling, uh, PJ uh, Utara, he said that he, he spoke English to me when we met at Starbucks. So I thought, oh, okay, I can join this party because this guy can speak English. Uh, I, can, I can relate. And so that's exactly how I joined the DAP to support my friend Edward. And uh, fast forward, 2007, uh, 2007, I joined the DAP. 2008, 
Pakla, the former prime minister then, dissolved parliament. When he dissolved parliament, I just got married at that time. I got married January 2008. February 2008, 13 February, Pakla dissolved parliament. And I was asked to run for Subang Jaya. Why? Because at that time, opposition had no opportunities to win seats. Okay? It was an MCA stronghold in Subang Jaya. So they say, okay, opposition, just give these seats to all the young people, just give it a try because they are not going to win. Okay? And nobody wanted to contest because you have to take out 100,000 ringgit to run. I didn't have that money. I just got married. Remember, 1,008 also surviving at home. And so I didn't have the money, but I was given the seat to run, and it was Subang Jaya, my hometown, and I was very passionate about it. So I said, okay, I will, I will do it. Uh, my commitment is just to do the campaign. Two weeks, I'm not going to win. I'll go back to work as an event per person. So I told my boss, I'll come back. Don't worry. And then we won. And that year, in 2008, a lot of young people won the election. Nuro Iza won. Nick Nazmi won. Uh, the current MB, Amiruddin Shari, won. Tony Paul won, Gobin Singh won, Tony Ching won. All of us were swept in year 2008. And that was the first time Selangor changed government. Uh, first time you know, in history, five states changed. And, and so that's how I got involved in politics, really. Uh, with zero experience, uh, zero experience, I got into lawmaking. But I can tell you the benefit of having people without experience in politics entering politics. Because they come in with fresh ideas, fresh way of doing things. So 2008, I think, changed the landscape of politics in Malaysia because a lot of new first-term uh, uh, MPs and Aduns were swept into power. So that's my history of how I got involved in politics. Now, well-being. Let me go straight to the topic. Yeah. Um, so if you want to promote youth development, you've got to understand the phase and the stage of emotions, uh, and growth that youth and young people are involved in. If you don't understand what phase they are in, it's very hard to help develop them. Based on my own understanding, I think youth and young people, and my own story, they are passionate, they are eager. At the same time, they are very curious. It's a very curious phase in their life. Uh, they, are, they, they take time to build their confidence and to find their purpose. A lot of young people, even if I do a survey here with the young people here, if I give you an opportunity to migrate, if you are given two offers, uh, one from UPM and one from Harvard University, how many of you would move to Harvard? Put up your hands. Be very honest. You would think and you would just take the offer and leave. Just put up your hands. Don't need to be shy. Professors don't turn around. Yeah, that's a lot of hands. That's a lot of hands. It's, and it's, it's normal human nature, you know, to always pursue what we think is greener overseas. And also, in this period of being young, you are also in your phase of finding love and embarking into relationship. It is the normal phase of life. So when you have all these things mixed together, Finding identity, purpose, confidence, discovering who you are, losing weight, uh, gaining weight, all this, this confusing time. They have very, very little time for policy making and government programs. And so, understanding the phase young people are at, when you are doing intervention, you've got to be mindful. So, it's not easy. Un Unless they are in university, it's very hard to gather young people to come and sit in a lecture hall to hear a lawmaker talk. Okay, so this is our challenge today. How do we send our message out and how do we help these young people? Okay, when you are talking about well-being, you have to talk about two aspects. Promotion of well-being, awareness, and also protection. How do you make policies to protect them? So I just want to share with you some very brief example uh, of testing out new things and trying out. About 10 years ago, when I was still the assemblyman for Subang Jaya, Adun for Subang Jaya, I started receiving uh, police reports about people committing suicide. And you must know, in Subang Jaya, that is the place for higher institutions. All the colleges, uh, Taylor's University, is all in Subang Jaya. And so when I started receiving police reports like that, uh, and they, they the the... Because Subhanja, as Adun, you are meant to know the community. So when there's a funeral, they'll tell me this, this young person committed suicide. So I would make an effort to go to the funeral, 
to speak to the parents. And usually it's a very, very confusing time for the family, very, very painful. And so I started writing to the police to ask for data, how many people actually commit suicide. And then I found out that there's no registry for suicide. Because of a lack of budget, the government stopped keeping track of these numbers. And a lot of time, because of stigma, these deaths are, really, are, are recorded as sudden death or unknown, unknown reason. So when you do not have data, you do not have proper intervention. When you don't have data to justify spending, you will not have budget in government agencies allocated to fight that problem. So we started talking about it, writing. I asked for data, started talking about it. And when I had a professional from, uh, expert from US, he came. I asked him, I say, you know, I say, doctor, I would like to just put a talk out there in MBSJ. In MBSJ, uh, what topic shall we talk about? So he said, let's just talk about understanding the suicidal mindset. I said, okay, let's just put it out there. You know, I was shocked. The whole auditorium was full and I had an overflowing auditorium outside that I had to put up a uh, screen. So that shocked me. Why would there be such an interest in understanding the suicidal mindset? And in that room were a lot of grieving friends, friends who have lost their friends, a lot of parents and caregivers who didn't take the symptoms seriously. So they were struggling with guilt and they wanted to know what was in the mind of this person. And so when I did that, I realized this is, a, this is such a scary topic because no one is really equipped to deal with it. Okay, you have mental health situation. And then I found out one in three Malaysians struggling with that. And in Sabah, that is the state with the highest numbers. Why? I can, I can imagine the number of stateless people in Sabah is very high. Now, if you lose your IC, you lose your my card, you cannot open bank account, you cannot go to university, you cannot get a driving license, you cannot get married, what would be the state of your condition here? You would be in that, that situation. That's why statelessness is so big a problem that finally now the unity government, our new home minister, is making it a priority to resolve all the outstanding stateless applications. Statelessness issues will not go away. These children are here, born here. They don't know any other land, right? So if you don't deal with this, these are the numbers that you would see come back after 18 years to haunt you. So that's one on mental health. So awareness, a new issue, testing things out and then finding the data and then start talking about it. So for a long time, we started talking about decriminalizing suicide. Start talking about registry of suicide. And now the government will be decriminalizing um, suicide. So it takes time when you start talking about something for it to eventually see progress. Now, the second thing I want to talk about is the method of reaching out to youth and young people. Those days when I was in school and when you were in school, there's no internet. We all read physical newspaper every morning there will be a newspaper delivered to your house. Then you go to school. After school, you stay back in school, practice sports, because even if you go home, there's nothing for you to do. There's no astro, you know, back then. It's just you wait for the, the 5 p.m., 6 p.m. for the cartoon channel to come up. You just sit in front of the TV and you wait. And then you watch news. All of us watch TV3, TV1, TV2. Then you go to sleep and your day repeats itself. So that was the generation without Wi-Fi, without gadget, without handphone. There's no handphone, you call the house. You have to memorize friends' phone numbers. Do you remember that era? And you have to speak to the parents before you get to speak to your friends. And then you sit at the stairs because that's where the phone will be. Usually parents will put the stairs at a place that is so uncomfortable so that you will not sit there for long. That was the era. So we didn't have these kind of challenges. No exposure to pornography online, no exposure to grooming, nothing. It's all physical. Back then, disciplinary teachers would only have to deal with smoking, gangsterism, ponting scholar. That's all. Or liquid paper. Or sometimes they don't cut hair. Today, all kinds. And today, I tell parents, even if your children are at home, they are not safe. They could be in the bedroom doing something with their gadget. So, Challenges, exposures, very different. So back then, if you listen to politicians back then, the traditional way of reaching out would be, let's set up canopy, 
we turun padang, we do a masdes, we do a cerama, we do a talk, and we get all the kampung people, residents, everybody come out. Then we tell you, and then we control the media by telling the media what to put on TV because why 5 p.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m. everybody will be watching TV. So it's so easy to control the national narrative. Today, even if you do free TV station shows, nobody is watching. The only time they all watch around this this generation uh, was during PKP's time. Movement control order. You would sit and wait for the Prime Minister's announcement when your sector will be open, when you can go out and buy groceries. That's the only time the whole nation watched TV. Right? So times have changed. Now, how do you then as a lawmaker reach out to people? Whether you like it or not, you have to use online way of reaching out. So when I was Deputy Minister of Women, Family and Community Development, I look at the data for child abuse, grooming, okay? And these are numbers that come in involving children of very, very young age. They are, you are talking about zero to six to seven years old. Why? Because this age group cannot talk yet. They are confused with safe touch and bad touch. Because the way you touch them would be the same as their parents. So they are very confused. They don't know what's bad and what's good. Now, if I know that this is the vulnerable target group, and at the same time, I can do programs, but these children are not going to come out. You will never see me doing a program with four-year-old, five-year-old, let's gather, let's sit down, I teach you safe touch, bad touch. Cannot. So you have to think of new ways. So what did I do? I went to Google, Google Malaysia, spoke to Google, and I said, Google, I want you to help me advertise. So I paid, I tell you how I work, huh? I paid 20,000 ringgit only to an NGO promoting and fighting against pornography. I tell this NGO, I give you 20,000 grand, you develop short videos, one minute video, I can't remember, one or two minutes. Very short video, content, I want local Malaysian characters, children. So these characters, these children, they wear tudung, they, 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 these are our kids, okay? I want that character and I want you to teach them how to differentiate safe touch, bad touch and how to respond. So Google said, okay, let's work on this. So what Google did, Google looked at YouTube, the, more, the most popular videos that children zero to six years old would watch. So they identified Upin and Ipin, Baby Shark, I think all kinds, all kinds of videos that children watch. So they said, these are the videos. So then I said, okay, now you're watching ads, milk la, TV la, I, I don't know, la, all, the, all the ads before you actually get to watch your YouTube video. So I say, I want this short video to be advertised by Kementerian Wanita to children directly. So I talk directly to that, that girl watching Baby Shark on what is Sentuhan Selamat, what is safe touch and what is bad touch. And so I'm just going to show you this very short video that we did and we, we push it out through Google. Um, and can you play the video? Hai, ini Lily. Setiap petang selepas sekolah, Abang Bob, seorang tutor pribadi, akan datang ke rumah Lily dan mengajarnya. Tetapi, Abang Bob mempunyai niat yang tidak baik terhadap Lily. Abang Bob ingin mengambil kesempatan dan meraba Lily. Yeah. <laughs> Lily kemudian menjerit dan melarikan diri dari Abang Bob. Lily kemudian memberitahu ayahnya mengenai kejadian tersebut. Lalu, ayah Lily menelefon 999 untuk melaporkan kejadian tersebut kepada pihak berkuasa. Akhirnya, Abang Bob berjaya ditangkap oleh polis. Ingat ya adik-adik, jika ada sesiapa menyentuh di mana-mana bahagian badan adik-adik, jerit dan lari. Kemudian, bagi tahu kepada ibu bapa atau penjaga mengenai kejadian tersebut. Suatu petang, Mili, Lily dan Nur bermain di taman permainan berdekatan rumah mereka. Tetapi, ada seseorang yang sedang memahatikan mereka. Yeah. <laughs> Dengan tiba-tiba, orang itu telah menunjukkan kemaluannya kepada mereka. Mili, Lily dan Nur lalu mencari dan melarikan diri mereka dari orang jahat tersebut. Lily kemudian yang memberitahu ibunya yang kebetulan berada berhampiran. Lalu, ibu Lily menelefon 
Sembilan, sembilan, sembilan untuk melaporkan kejadian tersebut kepada pihak berkuasa. Akhirnya, orang jahat itu berjaya ditangkap oleh polis. Ingat ya adik-adik, jika ada sesiapa menunjukkan kemaluannya pada adik-adik, jerit dan lari. Kemudian beritahu kepada ibu bapa atau penjaga mengenai kejadian tersebut. Okay. So, how how much did we spend on a project like that? This video reached 2.79 million children 0 to 6 years old in Malaysia. Google can track based on all these videos. 2.79 million children. Direct access, no need to put up kema, no need to give free food. 20,000 grant to Malaysians against pornography NGO to develop this video. 60,000 ringgit to promote the ad. That's all I spent. And it reached 2.79 million. So when you have your target group now, this is how you need to find new ways of doing things. You cannot use the same way. Okay? Um, duration of engagement. Nowadays, when you're dealing with young people, Within five minutes, if my story is not interesting, they would be on their phone already. They'll be replying WhatsApp. They'll be talking to other friends and working and, and replying. And so when you are dealing with youth today, you need to understand that distraction is not outside the audit auditorium anymore. Distraction is on their lap and in their pocket. Okay, so it's going to be very challenging for lecturers uh, to impart. And so your, your, your term, that you have with them becomes shorter and shorter. So you are constantly struggling to compact your message for, for them to chew on and take. And those days when I started in politics, I only had to do articles and put up on blogs. Then came Facebook, then Twitter. From Facebook posts, now Twitter, 160 characters. Then Instagram, no more talking, just photos and videos. Now TikTok is even worse. It's just dancing, just movement, and that's all. You cannot even write three sentences on TikTok videos because nobody would be reading. Okay? So you are constantly coming up against new medium like this. How do you reach out? So that's something I think young people, you, that would be your challenge. Uh, and together with us now, how do you reach out to these young people? So you have that duration thing that you are uh, fighting. Now, the, the issue of protection. How do you protect youth from being violated? When I talk about youth, our population now, 15 to 30 years old in Malaysia, is 9 uh, million, also 30%. Children, 0 to 18, also 9 million, 30%. Okay? How do you fight to protect them? So you have to, again, look at the data. So I just want to share with you a brief experience I had trying to fix a problem. So we all know in Malaysia, you can have pedophiles, people who violate children sexually, and then they are convicted, but there is no registry. Unlike US, one app, you know how many of them live in your community. Over here, you don't know. The person sitting next to you, your neighbor, the person who drives the school van, you don't know. You are sending your child to a pengaso, to a nanny. The nanny's husband, you don't know whether they have this background or not. So what do you do? So when I was deputy minister again, I started knocking on the police door, PDRM. I say, please share this data with us. PDRM say, cannot, official secret. One commentary to another commentary. And this is something all of you must understand. Huh? It's really a struggle trying to get everybody to work together and to share data. Okay? So they say, cannot, we cannot give to the women ministry. But I need to develop something. I need to start somewhere. Because why? I'm having a lot of cases of Pengaso's husband, Pengaso's father-in-law, brother, uncle, sexually abusing children who are being sent to the home to be looked after. Okay? One very tragic case I went was a toddler sexually abused by the grandfather. Okay, so how can I quickly develop a registry like that when I cannot get the data from police? So what I did, I went to see the chief judge, Tun Richard Malanjum at that time. I told the judge, I said, Chief Justice, Yang Ahmad Arif, we have this problem. Can I start somewhere every time 
the courts convict somebody of Sexual Offences Against Children Act. I have to start somewhere, so that's 2017. Every time you convict somebody, please send the name to Women Ministry and we would compile. And Chief Justice said, okay, this is a very noble project, we would do that. So every month they would send to us. And we work in-house, we compile from the beginning of the Act 2017 to now, it's being updated. Every person who's convicted, that name will be put up and then we tell all our pengaso and all everybody who's giving parents, parents license, uh, teachers, teachers, and I tell them if you're going to hire a tennis coach, you're going to hire a bus driver, please get their IC and check because this service is so, so easy to do. And so I'm just going to share with you that short video of how we develop this uh, media. Please play. I share this with you because every project that you undertake to protect children, these children will one day become your youth. And every child that you can protect from being violated in any way, you are preserving their well-being when they become a youth. So I don't know the impact of this project, but it's better than just sitting around doing nothing and just accept the fact that, okay, nobody's going to share data with me, nobody wants to help me, but you go and knock on different doors. If this, you are stuck, you go and see another department. Somewhere along the line, people with the same mindset will be able to help you and you can, you can do something. Okay, very quickly, I just want to move on with um, data. That's why data in today's world for you is so powerful. Everything must start with data. Without data, you cannot plan intervention. So now, with Ministry of Youth and Sports, what I'm doing also, I, I tell Iris, your partner here, I say, Iris, I want you to present to me data involving youth, social problems. Because every single cent I spend on in our Ministry of Youth and Sports must be targeted at solving this data, this, this problem. There's no point, I just do leadership program. Okay, let me tell you, I'm all for leadership programs. I believe in leadership programs. But leadership programs are the easiest programs to do in the world. Why? You're dealing with leaders. They are very driven and motivated. You don't have to do a lot. They will come already. So you, when you are doing leadership programs, you are really targeting the 10%, the top, top young people. But there's the 90% that really need help that will never find their way into your programs. So that's why we must reach out. So what are the data that we have? Uh, you, you are dealing with bankrupt youth. That's something we spoke about and now the government is doing something to address that. Then you're dealing with drowning. Ministry of Health data shows that every year about 500 children die from drowning. So as Kementerian Belia and Sukan, Ministry of Youth and Sports, I have public pools, I have swimming coaches. What are we going to do about that? So we announced we're going to use money, pay coaches to teach swimming for free for children in public pools from B40 communities. I have to start small, I have to start somewhere, but let's just start it. And after we announce that, there's now requests coming from other people to say, Let's not just give swimming lessons to the poor children. How about flooded areas? Every year we'll flood one. Let's give the Waga Amas also free swimming lesson. So you see, there's actually so many things we can do in Malaysia, you know. There's so many opportunities. 
if we just think out of the box and don't do the same program every year. That means don't just come in and assume because everybody's been doing this, this must be a very good program. Yes, very good, but maybe you're only targeting 10% and you're not, still not solving other problems. Okay, so use data to solve problems. Um, I want to talk about online addiction. Now, we talk about well-being. I am in the business of promoting eSports. Why? eSukan is now a registered is I registered under Akta Pembangunan Sukan as a type of sport. It's very popular. Young people are all into gaming. But there's also the side effect of people being addicted to phone. Even adults, all of us, me, I am also included. You take away my handphone for one hour, I feel very uneasy. I feel like I have nothing to do. I don't know. I feel very restless. That's why we all don't like when people tell us to surrender handphones outside. We feel like something is missing, you know, like our hands are missing or I see missing like that. That's a sign of that you are overly dependent on your gadget. So children, the same thing. You remove their iPad, they cannot function, especially after COVID. What are we going to do about that now? So during COVID, in my job as MP, I get calls from family. They don't know what to do with the kid. When they're off the Wi-Fi, the child wants to strangle the family member, violent at home, when they're off the Wi-Fi. So those days, parents will say, you don't behave, I ground you, you cannot go out. Today, you will find a lot of parents say, I ground you by removing your iPad or I switch off the Wi-Fi. And then the kids will strict, quickly, quickly comply. Finish their food, do their homework. Why? Because I need my Wi-Fi. So with online tool, you're going to have online addiction. So now, I tell universities, schools everywhere, it's good to promote online stuff, but please provide the tool to de help de detox. You must teach them how to detox and how to detach. If you don't teach them how to detox, nobody else will. It becomes a very serious problem for Kementerian Kesehatan later on. And for those of us in my age now, I tell you what you will struggle next when you use this all the time. You struggle with backache. I have very severe backache. I had to go physio and the physio told me it's because of this. When you hold this, long usage, especially when you are in bed or when you're seated down and you're not in the right position. So talk about well-being. The youth today, you might not have the problem, but when you turn 40 like me, it's going to come back and haunt you, I tell you. Now we all put plaster at the back, go for physio. Okay, so on online and gadget addiction. Okay. Um, today also, you're dealing, I, I share with you how people now, they are all into TikTok. Facebook Live. People just like to live everything. Why? Because they like organic content, not choreographed, not planned, original. Sometimes we just like to see how people mess things up. And, and so that's how the young people today enjoy that kind of content. Uh, that's why TikTok is so popular. So how, how do we fight that? I don't know. I, I, I'm still struggling. Young children now, they are into ASMR. You know that? I, I found out from my daughters. I'm like, why, why are you constantly doing that? What is that thing called? Slime. Slime. And then they put bar things inside and then they just want to pull. And then they, when, when envelopes arrive, my daughter takes joy in when you open the box, the parcel. Oh, ASMR. Then I went on YouTube and saw ASMR. They're just into listening to this sound to de-stress, it's th therapeutic. So, more and more, some professors are like, what ASMR? <laughs> but the, the youth are, are, are changing. They no longer find university talk stimulating, but slime is very stimulating for them. And then you have toy review, food review. It's so huge. You know, apparently Malaysian men, 30s and 40s, spend a lot of time watching YouTube on food reviews. Men. Fried rice with the egg, with curry chicken. They, they just find that so enjoyable. I'm so sorry to do this during Ramadan. But apparently that's a trend with Malaysian men. So that's why you get a lot of Malaysian influencer men doing more and more cooking content. How, how do we fight this? I don't know. It's changing so fast. How do we help this youth? Um, and it's very emotional when you're using stuff like that. 
That's why in the last election, they found there's a lot of hate uh, speech content online, WhatsApp. It's so easy to fitna somebody and watch it. Just People just believe in things like that. If it's fitna, or they just want to believe that it's true. I, I, I am a victim of so many fitna, I, I lose count. People just like to believe that every day, I'm converting many, many, many people to become Christians in Malaysia. I can't even convince my family. But people believe this fitna that I'm converting a lot of Muslims. And, and you know, this fitna, because it's so sensational, people will just want to believe it and, and, and forward. But when the truth comes out, Nobody will forward. Why? Because it's no longer exciting. So people like hateful content. It's just, it's just more sensational to send. But a lot of people are, are struggling with this now. How do you fight false narrative like that? Hate speech in Malaysia. So that's why I think we need, to, we need to start talking about this to help young people to become more responsible before we share things to verify. It's not difficult to verify. You just have to go to the... Just go to their official page and you'll find that most likely this is fake and fitna. Okay? Um, personal application for myself. How do I deal with this every day? I learn to detach from com comments. Okay? And this is something we have to teach young people. You can use social media. It's okay. But you must learn not to take comments as truth. Because you don't even know who is sitting behind there typing. Now, our athletes are struggling because after every badminton match, they get very hateful comments and they get affected. So if our young people don't know how to detach, we don't teach them that these could be fake comments. This could be cyber troopers, people who are paid to just type. If you don't know how to digest all this, then it's very challenging to be promoting social media like that among young people. So this is something I think UPM, you can do more, think about ways to help people disengage, uh, so to preserve their well-being. And so I, I just want to end with this, um, with, with challenges, we need new solutions. And you cannot be thinking about new solutions without engaging the people of their generation. So that's why in every agency, lawmaking place, you need to pump in the new people into the system. You need to get younger people into board, board members, because they can think like them and they know how to solve problem of that generation. So more and more universities, you really have to find a way for the student leaders, the board and all, to be part of the decision-making process so that they can think of solutions that go directly at addressing the people, the, the, the times uh, that they are living in. Uh, even for me, in my 40s, I struggle to think about ways to help those who are struggling in their teens. But you have to use the teens to help us along this journey. Okay? So, I really believe Malaysia has no shortage of talent. I believe that Malaysia has no shortage of resources, ideas, and also, I really believe that Malaysians are very resilient people. That means you pull them down, they'll bounce back. You pull them down, they'll bounce back. And they'll always find ways around it. Okay? Cannot mati one. We will not be stuck with a problem. We will always find our ways around that problem. And so because of that, with great challenges come great opportunities for us for the future. So I'm very excited. So I'm constantly thinking of new ways, new ways. Come, let's just do new things to engage uh, the youth. Okay, so with that, I thank you for the opportunity. I will now take questions. Thank you, Wabihana. Please uh, take your seats uh, on the stage. And please welcome Yang Berbahagia, Professor Dr. Abdul Latif Kraus Abdullah, the Deputy Director, IFSAS, UPM, to lead the question and answer sessions. Yes. Prof. Latif, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you, Zai. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to everyone. Um, and YB, it's great to have you here. Uh, and thank you for the very personal and heartfelt uh, lecture. Um, how does it feel to be a lecturer in university now? <laughs> You're ready to take over our job, so. If, I, if, I think you know. I have an easy audience because, uh, you know, a lot of them are professors, uh, but I'm not sure whether the same lecturers have 
have the same privilege or not for every every morning you make them come and sit in the class. Yeah. Well, um, so this is we have about uh, about twenty five minutes, yeah. thirty minutes for questions. Uh, I'm just going to get the ball rolling because there's a lot of young people here, and I really hope that uh, for those of you who are here in attendance, you'll take the opportunity to interact with your minister of youth and sports, and we will open the floor for questions in a minute. Okay, so please prepare your questions now because it's not every day you get this opportunity to. Uh, to ask questions directly to uh, YB, uh, uh, youth, uh, the Youth and Sports Minister. So YB, um, your, your lecture was very, touched on many really important topics. Um, and we're all very much aware of the complexity of these issues. Uh, and one of the things that you, 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 you touched on was the fact that um, we have many different ministries in Malaysia. Yeah. We have women and family and community, we have youth and sports, we have education. Um, and often the way they work is they work in silos, yeah. but the, the problems are so complex and they cut across so many different areas and dimensions of, of everyday life. As a minister now, how do you see, is there any remedy for that? Is there anything that we can do to get government to work yeah. more across disciplines? Yeah, this is something that our new prime minister, that is Sri Anwar Ibrahim, uh, is putting a lot of emphasis on and even in his budget announcement he wants ministries to be sharing a certain amount of budget so he would announce an amount and then he would say two to three ministries you now share this budget so then you you sit down and you start planning so you won't be doing and uh, your own and there'll be no wastages and that's the reason why now we are having tvet being restructured because we when we came in we found out that there are 12 ministries doing tvet more than 1 billion ringgit spent, more than 1,000 institutions, everybody is doing their own thing. Now it's all being parked under Deputy Prime Minister and we are talking about how can we bring all this TVET together so that there's no wastages and greater synergy. Okay, well, good luck. Uh, I know it's a, it's a big task. Um, even in university, we, we tend to be very secularized in the way we work as well. And um, in the field of youth development, we really try to... Uh, we're really trying to do more interdisciplinary work along these lines. And so I think it would be very helpful if government is also working from that perspective. One way, one way yeah. to force people to work together is to not give them enough money. They automatically will have to find more money and they'll have to find ways of working together. That's why during lockdown, you remember, during lockdown, when we have very little resources, even Malaysians just came together to share food, to... to, to work on food distribution, you are, when you are forced to work together out of your comfort zone, things get done. Yeah. And also maybe adjusting the KPIs also, right? Incentivizing it, right? Incentivizing it. Um, and as, as a minister in the government, the role of NGOs is very important also. Yeah. How do you see, uh, at least moving forward as the minister, how do you, how do you see uh, the role of NGOs fitting in with what you want to do as the minister of youth and yeah. sports? Every policy, you need to implement something. You need the people to help you implement it. It's more effective. Um, I, I believe in working with our partners. And now in um, uh, KBS, you have sports associations, one corner, and you have youth bodies, another corner. How do you get them all together? Uh, because both very important segment, very extensive outreach. And so we recently launched Kot Sukan Slamat to promote uh, a safe environment for athletes and sports uh, activities. So what we did this time, we say we are going to cross it to the youth side because youth also do a lot of these programs. So we get the youth bodies to also come alongside the sports association and sign a commitment that they will also promote safe sport code. So you just want people to be working together. Yeah, that's very important. And if you, if you don't work with others, the video, I could have done that video myself by hiring a designer. But why don't I grow another NGO who is promoting that and promote their work at the same time in our video? Uh, and, and so more people will benefit, more people believe in your vision, they will work with you. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's just the right way, I think, of working. That was actually a question I was going to ask you. Is sports in Malaysia, especially competitive sports, um, tends to get a lot more press and visibility than, say, the youth development side of your yeah. ministry. Uh, how do you, do you see that as a challenge at all and as a leader for the ministry? I think for youth, they have a lot of ideas. You, they don't have to sit and, and wait for coordination and ideas because they, they can move on their own. But 
what we want is to help youth who cannot help themselves. That's why I tell all my youth agencies, let's work on the 90%. That's why the first topic I spoke about in December when I was appointed is about Belia Muflis, youth who are bankrupt. How can we help this group? Because if we don't help them, they will forever be in your welfare list for the rest of their life. But if KBS comes in and intervenes and get other agencies to help, you know, this group can then be set free and you, you can have intervention. So start thinking about the unique position that you are in and what you can do to help those who cannot help themselves. That's why I tell them focus less on 10% who can help themselves, move on the 90%. Right, right. Yeah, I really appreciate your, your um, sentiment about youth leadership. One of the things Prof. Ismi mentioned in his opening speech about one of the things that we do at UPM is we really try to emphasize uh, research on youth adult partnership. And I think one of the things that we do with that is we, is we try to emphasize that youth leadership is not just for the 10%. So how can the youth associations in Malaysia, the youth organizations, help the other 90% get those leadership opportunities? So it's not just for the elite youth. Yeah. And so maybe you want to comment a little bit on that, how, how that can be. I think it's important to give people opportunities. So we don't have to do the job for them, but create platforms, give them platform, and also sell them vision. Young people, if you give them the right vision, you tell them what you want to achieve, but how to get there, you leave it to them, right? They, they will be able to get there. The only struggle they face is when there's no vision for them. They don't know what you're working at. They cannot run alongside you. Yeah, so it's very important, I think, to just keep the engagement ongoing and to constantly share the problems with them. That's why data sharing is so crucial. Government cannot hide data. Because you hide data, data is of no use. But data is money, data, data, are, they, data can be ideas. So when we share data like drowning, I may not have the solution, but a, a youth association, if you tell them that in their district, a lot of young kids are dying, they will be able to think of the solution. But if I don't share the data, it's of no use to anybody. That's why I think for government, we don't have to do everything. But we believe in open data and we must start sharing it. Yeah. Great. Okay. So now I would just like to open the floor for questions. Yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. There's a microphone right there. You can step up and ask uh, YB, Hannah, your question. It's okay. You, if you speak, I can hear. Yeah. It's not that big a hall. Okay. Ring lip. Oh, thank you. Business. Uh, I am Hadi. Uh, actually, I'm from uh, Sabah. I'm Sabahan. So I'm really delighted that you are raised the issue. Uh, regarding the sadless children in Sabah. So we know that there's the these children uh, roaming the city center and some uh, some of them uh, knock the car windows begging uh, some money and yeah. and we just reflect there and up uh, committing uh, crimes. Okay, so so I be is it solution the cat long uh, issue so any yeah. i mean yeah the issue of statelessness in sabah cannot be resolved without involving sabah leaders sabah leaders must be involved because it's a big election issue every single election that issue is played up so that's why i think it's important to put aside the political cap both sides in sabah must sit down and agree on one method to take this forward. Because if they cannot agree on this, it becomes a political issue every single election and nobody dares to move. Okay, So Sabah's situation is very unique. They have to sit down and work on an agreed way forward, both government and opposition leaders, that they will not use this as a political card. Then they can move forward and, and solve it. Um, the other issue, I cannot remember already what I want to say, but when I remember back, I'll answer. Okay, Hadi, thank you for your question. Any other questions from the floor, please? Oh, yes, we have some over here. Uh, is there a microphone that we could send over to the other side of the room? You can use this one if you want. While you wait for the microphone, I remember already. 
you 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 mentioned about children knocking on doors, beggars. Okay, there are three types of people who knock on your doors, and how you respond, who you call, is very important. Okay, if they are Malaysians, they are not supposed to beg. Begging is not allowed. You need a permit to be asking table to table for donation. Okay, now number two, you, they could be refugees carrying a UNHCR card. If is UNHCR card, then you have to inform UNHCR. If they don't have card, that means they are illegal or stateless. Then you call the police. Okay, so and, and a lot of times people don't know. You can just call uh, Talian Kase one five nine nine nine. Okay, usually they will then call the relevant bodies for you, and they will come and they will take. Uh, so this becomes very complex because most time people cannot tell by just looking. They don't know whether you are refugee. It's a mother with a baby. They don't know. So I think the best way is I think you just contact the local police or one five nine nine nine. Send the location and say they are here. Can somebody come and come and talk to them? Yeah. Okay. So Hello, hi, greetings to YB. Nice to meet you today. Uh, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Logoendra Loganathan, first year student from Bachelor of Horticulture from Faculty of Agriculture. Uh, currently, uh, I'm from I'm representing from Student Representative Council. So my question is about leadership questions. So like, how the ministry can involve university students to get involved along with the ministry to get in experience in leadership skills, like uh, students from uh, Representative Council to set a level with higher ministry education to look at the youth well-being issues to stand out as the future leaders. Okay, so we're going to, uh, obviously KPT is directly involved with all of you uh, and I, I know KPT also has their programs. Uh, so maybe you can talk about that at the, at the university level. There are plenty of programs happening. Uh, one thing that we want to launch this year would be to bring back Rakan Muda in a big way. And to bring back Rakan Muda, uh, we will have to work with KPM and also KPT. And all other programs that we want will all be parked under Rakan Muda so that there's greater synergy and also greater coordination. Okay, Rakan Muda is very well known during my time. I, I, we were like the first batch in 1990s. And today we are all parents of teenagers. So when you bring Rakan Muda back, you, you reach out across generations. The parents believe in Rakan Muda. They will make sure their kids sign up for Rakan Muda. So that's how we hope to have more buy-in. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. The girl. Yeah. Okay. Hello. So my name is Farah Izati, and I am a first-year student from French Language Studies from the Faculty of Modern Languages and Communication. So actually, I have a question for YB. It is regarding the situation of us as a woman in the lawmaking sector uh, because as it can be seen that there are not that many of young people in the lawmaking sector and people tend to not really trust the women especially younger leaders in the lawmaking sector so how do you face with this and how do you uh how do i say this how we expect us to actually go and model through the lawmaking sector because it is a very interesting way for us to actually be involved and actually create a new changes in our lawmaking sector. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I believe in um, role models uh, and you can see now with our Chief Justice being a lady, uh, there's more prominence. Uh, a lot of federal court judges are ladies. Uh, so definitely today, we are a lot better than maybe 20 years ago uh, in terms of women in, in lawmaking. And they mentioned just now, I was also the first woman speaker. Uh, so when I took over in year 2013, uh, there was no woman speaker. I remember going to the speaker's conference, all men, and people would look at me and say, you know, which one is your husband? So they assume I was there because I'm a wife of a speaker. Uh, but when you have people just breaking glass ceiling more and more, I think, uh, it, will, it will smash away some of these uh, stereotypes or, or prejudices against uh, women. So I, I, I definitely think that when it comes to practitioners, I don't think we have a shortage of women in practice. I just think that uh, maybe, I don't know, the whole time I, I was not long in law, uh, 
I didn't experience discrimination in any way uh, or people not trusting women lawyers. I didn't have that experience. So I'm not sure about the data that you're referring to. But I really believe now there is a greater prominence being placed when we have uh, more women being uh, exalted in these places and being given the opportunity to showcase their leadership. Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Usman Gilani. I'm from Pakistan and I'm studying PhD in Islamic Thought and Civilization, ISTEC IAUM. Uh, and I'm the president of Pakistan Student Society in IAUM. So uh, my question is for our minister. So uh, we see so many friends, uh, so many students. We have, uh, uh, they have depression in their study period. Like especially PhD, our PhD students, they have so many, so kind of uh, depressions like sometimes financial depression, sometimes workload depression. And I, I just experienced myself that uh, I just stuck myself for two months in, in my room. I just never uh, came out. So I, I, I think there is a very serious problem some, sometimes. So what do you think that as a student, what we do because we are we are afraid to go to the mental doctor to psychiatrist yeah. that people said oh he's a he's a mental problem yeah. so it, it is very big issue yeah. so what do you think that what we should do to resolve this problem thank okay. you so much one of the things i was working on before sheraton move happened was to work with uh, ministry of health to remove the stigma of getting help for mental health i said that the mental health um, unit or they call it the mentari project cannot be parked in a hospital. We're going to move that unit into shopping malls. I say it must be as natural as going into DG to pay DG bill or Maxis. The same way I would go and get mental health help. So we need to normalize it. And so maybe UPM can start thinking about, about this. Uh, one project that we did uh, in Subang back then was to work with psychology students in providing uh, chairs so I, I paid for the chairs. They set up the chairs in front of Sunway Pyramid Lion Head. It's called the Listening Project, right? They don't offer legal advice. They don't offer any help. But these are just students listening. So they sign confidentiality pledge uh, and they do referral when they hear that, okay, this person is thinking of committing suicide. I'm going to activate and, and get help. So just from the Listening Project, we managed to stop three cases of suicide. Okay, so maybe you can do more and more of these programs where there is more compassion being placed in getting help and, and removing stigma. I think when, you, when the numbers grow, then when people start thinking, oh, it's not just 30%, 40%, 50% people want to talk about things like that, then people will feel comfortable enough to come and get help. Yeah, so we must make this a majority problem instead of just seeing that this is just a few people struggling with it. So there are many things we can do to normalize seeking help. Yeah. Can we have two more questions? Okay, just the three of them because they, they put up their hands. Yeah. Uh, so hello, good greetings and good day to YBU. So today, um, I, my question is kind of similar to this gentleman yeah, in front yeah. of me. So uh, actually, uh, I want to ask as a younger generation now, how do we increase the number of younger generative in the involvement on government initiative regarding the mental health issue? Because nowadays, um, even younger generation is afraid because of the stigma of um, when they're having the mental issues, there will be um, stigma that they were crazy if they go or went to the psychiatrist. Yeah. So uh, I want to ask in what we as a community can help the government and what the governments can help also so to working together. Yeah, I really think that awareness and talking about more success stories uh, will help people. Now, at the moment, we are still talking a lot about diagnosis. That means, oh, you have mental health problem, but we don't talk about the recovery. We don't talk about how people actually get better after seeking help. So if we sell more of these stories, and uh, like just now I share, I had brief depression. It was not diagnosed by a professional, but I recognized it because I didn't want to go out. I didn't want to meet people. I, I recognized those symptoms. And so when I talk about it, then maybe people in this room feel that, okay, if she can have depression and it's okay for her to talk about it in a lecture like that, then I can also open up and tell people about it. 
Yeah. So that's when I think we, if we start more with success stories and where to get help, um, and also stop labeling it as, and that's something Parliament is very guilty of. Every time somebody talks nonsense in Parliament, another MP will stand up and say, hey, you tak makan ubat. As though taking medicine is such a bad thing. We all take medicine to feel better, to get better. Yeah. So that's why it must start. I think some of these languages that we use must stop. Yeah. Uh, hello, YB. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Alia and I'm a political science student from my IUM. So my question is uh, regarding the latest pass of the anti-stalking bill. Yes. Uh, and also the anti-sexual harassment law right now, yeah. which has already been implemented. Um, there are many cases happening every day, every single day. But one of the problems is that people find it hard to even lodge the report. Yeah. It really takes effort, it really takes time to even convince the authorities. So what can the government do in order to create a, a safer and a more welcoming environment in order to have people actually uh, help themselves and be able to lodge a report to the authorities? Okay, uh, sexual harassment law has been passed last year but it has not been implemented yet. We have to wait for the Tari Pelaksanaan from Kementerian Wanita while they set up the tribunal and all that. But at the same time, you have the Penal Code, Kanun Kesiksaan. They already have uh, sexual harassment law in there. The difference is, one provides for lodging police report. It's a criminal case, if you go. And the sexual harassment one is civil in nature, okay? where you get compensation, you get an apology and all that. Um, so for students, university, it depends on the nature of the complaint. If it's very, uh, you know that it's criminal, lodge a police report. Because there's really nothing embarrassing about becoming a complainant, uh, lodging it. In fact, Jabatan Pembangunan Wanita in 2019, when we did a study as to the prevalence of sexual harassment in our society, I think we got about 29,000 respondent if i'm not mistaken and majority of it came from university students so university is a place where there's many sexual harassment cases happening so there's nothing uh, that we should be fearful about talking about and i think this is where the university management can put up posters everywhere and say in this place we do not tolerate sexual harassment what is sexual harassment so you create more awareness so people know that uh, sexual harassment is also very subjective so if I say, Prof, you smell very nice. I say very innocently, but if Prof feels this is sexual in nature, why is she talk, commenting about my body scent? Then it can be sexual harassment because he feels uncomfortable with it. Right? So because it's subjective, that's why we say we need to do more educational awareness because not every person who's doing it, it is conscious of the fact that, hey, you know, I shouldn't be saying that. Some people say, hey, dear, dear. To them, they call every single person dear. But to the person who's hearing it, why are you calling me dear? I'm somebody's wife. You, you know? So that's why you need more educational awareness uh, to protect both sides so that they know they are not creating, not creating an offense and the other side knows where to get help. Where to get help is important. Uh, I was involved in the case of the Sungai Bulo doctor. Uh, came out front page sexually harassing a lot of junior doctors and it all started with the health minister then Dr. Zhou tweeting to say I will not tolerate cases like that the two two of the doctors found courage to lodge report and so sent an email to me and Dr. Zhou women ministry and health ministry combined work together set up a panel more than I think 20 if I'm not mistaken complainants then came forward and as a result, we managed to remove the doctor uh, from there. Sexual harassment usually happens to, uh, is, is done by people who are in position of authority and nobody would believe the victims. That's why the victims always struggle to, to share and to lodge complaint. So now with safe spot code, we make sure that in the safe spot code, there's a page on how to lodge a complaint because most people don't know how to lodge a complaint, what will happen after I lodge the complaint. So they are so afraid that everybody will be talking about them. And also victim shaming. You dress like that, so you deserve it. Uh, that kind of talk must stop. Because nobody invites sexual harassment upon themselves. Okay? Stalking also now is against the law. Uh, and the word re repetitive uh, or repeatedly is used in the law. 
Uh, so stalking is also in place now. So for those of you who are pursuing another girl, last time we call it the word tackle, right? I, I just don't give up. I just keep sending flowers. I keep sending flowers. But if it's already not welcome, one time you do it, second time you do it, still no response, don't do it a third time because it's stalking already. Okay, so that's why I think it's important new laws like that, maybe the university can do talks so that people are aware because not many people follow the debate in parliament and people don't know, oh, this is a new law. I shouldn't be sending flowers three times, four times. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. That, okay, one, two. Okay, 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 okay. Do a fast one, fast one. Yep. Yes. Okay. So now with safe spot code being in place, of course we don't uh, we don't um, uh, promote um, non accidental uh, harm being done to other athletes, uh, but other sports that are, are are rougher in nature, for example, like rugby. They are also talking to us about it, about how do we then secure insurance? Uh, because obviously there, there can be harm created through that spot, but it's non-accidental, do, do you know? So that's something I think uh, it's not talked a lot about it here. I think it's a new area uh, and we will have to find ways in the days ahead to, to tackle this as more and more. Uh, because now we have safe spot code already. So when we have complaints, then we have to deal with it. There's also extreme sports. There are a lot of these that can ha potentially have injuries in the process. Yeah. Uh, so far, no complaints yet. But the only thing I've heard so far from my town hall is about not being able to secure insurance. Okay. Yep. Straight to Soalan. Yes. Yep. Yes. Chegu Rahayu now is a staff of mine in my Segambut office. Okay. Um, stateless children, uh, I really believe that we need to apply compassion into this issue and I think Policies must not penalize innocent children. No child asked to be born stateless. It's not something that they can do to become stateless. They find themselves in that position the moment they are born stateless. So that's why we have to apply compassion. And you are going to see more and more. I think when Dr. Masli was health uh, education minister, they made a policy that if one of the parents is a Malaysian, even if stateless, this child should be able to enter school. Uh, of course, a lot of the MPs, we deal with so many cases. Every single MP, every time Kewaga Negaran issue is up in debate in parliament, we all have like 30, 40 files that we have to follow up in our kawasan. Uh, and the, the, the Home Minister is aware of this issue. There's already a taklimat done. Uh, he is trying to clear backlog first, the straightforward cases. Uh, but I think that uh, as we develop more into policy, talking about statelessness, I think the awareness on and the the compassionate uh, side of Malaysia must must come forward uh, It's very easy if you just read the online comments. It's very unkind to these children. Uh, but if you know a stateless child, then all of us know the challenges they face from education to healthcare to you know access to food. This these are all happening in this country now, and it involves. Uh, I think thousands, thousands of these children, uh, no fault of theirs. Uh, they can end up stateless even if their father is Malaysian. If their mother is a foreigner and they are not in a marriage, the child is stateless. Okay. So while we talk about the Malaysian mother who gave birth overseas, uh, we also have this category of Malaysian fathers, ma mother foreigner, but not in a registered marriage. Many, many of such cases in Malaysia also. So I, the Home Minister is taking steps to clear backlog first and then to address it step by step. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, one more, last one. Last one, really okay, last, last one. one. Really last one, because YB's in a tight schedule. Yeah. Okay, I have to disagree with your uh, view on that. Sexual harassment is not caused by clothes. Uh, we in the ministry, when we first developed that, uh, men are also victims of sexual harassment. So uh, a, a man who is dressed in batik and shirt like prof can be sexually harassed uh, because it's a subjective matter. So it really does not matter what you, what you wear. Uh, there are many rape victims who are fully covered they are also subject to rape. So uh, dress code is uh, constantly a hot topic here, but I think more awareness. That's why I believe in sharing of data. When you share the data and you know that even men who are covered up are also victims of sexual harassment, then you know it's no longer about dress code. Uh, we know of cases where grandmothers are also subject to, uh, to rape. So that's why I think uh, the, the educational part of the law and the, the, the statistics must be shared so that these findings help people. Uh, I, I, I do not blame uh, you for uh, thinking that that could be the cause because when we don't share enough of this data, then people will have their own conclusion as to how these issues happen. So that's why I believe data is information and it's powerful to help us solve problems. Okay, thank you so much everybody. Thank